everybody. Uh, my name is Spencer Crum. I'm excited to be here in Boston. Uh, it's my first time speaking on the East Coast, and there's a lot of people in this room, so this will be lots of fun. I work at IBM, and uh, uh, I'm Nibbleizer on IRC, I'm on GitHub, I'm on Twitter, uh, and then that bit.ly link is the link to the slides. So if you can't see the slides very well, feel free to grab that bit.ly link and just kind of click along. Um, I also tweeted it out like 30 seconds ago, so hopefully um, you can pick it up that way. So I am from Portland, and I travel a lot, so I want to—I try to encourage people that Portland is not a rainy, sad city. It's actually beautiful, or at least I used to, and then I decided I wanted to buy a house, so now I want you to know that Portland is terrible, <laughs> and it is full, and you are not to go there. <laughs> so I've been involved in a couple different things. I'm a contributor to OpenStack, which is kind of an open cloud. It's a big open source project. Um, I, I recently helped out with DevOps Days Portland, so thank you very much to the Portland Boston, or the Boston DevOps Days organizers. This is going great. Thanks to the sponsors. Thanks everybody for making that possible. Um, I'm part of the Siegel team, which is the Seattle GNU Linux Fest. So if you're in Seattle in November and you would like to talk about Linux, GNU, DevOps, um, that's a great place to check out. Um, I'm also part of the Open Infrastructure Day at Scale. So what we're gonna do is try to have a one day mini conference around next to Scale for people who are building infrastructure as an open source project or who are working on infrastructure for an open source project. If you're interested in that, come find me later. I'm gonna try to sit in one of the corners at lunch if anybody wants to talk to me after this. Um, and I also work with the Vox Populi group, which is a, uh, a puppet module community um, thing. So if you're working with puppet community, um, please reach out to me. So a lot of this is gonna be informed. You know, this is, the talk is called Code Review for Operations, and so it's a lot of like, how I think code review works in an operations context when we're looking at infrastructure as code type stuff. And that's informed by my experience for the last couple of years working on the OpenStack infrastructure team. And so OpenStack itself has 600 Git, re Git repos. Um, it had 20,000 commits in a six month window. Um, it had over 100,000 reviews on those 20,000 commits. So that's a huge amount of code churn. That's a huge amount of reviewing. That's all of OpenStack's development. And then what I work on is the underlying testing and release and code review infrastructure underneath the open source project. So if someone writes a change to OpenStack, you know, to change some piece of OpenStack code, they do it on a server that I administer, and then the testing that it is performed is done on things that I administer. So that's sort of what I do. And so we run the infrastructure of, of, of OpenStack as an open source project, which means open code reviews, and so we, we use a lot of things like Puppet's Hira functionality to keep most of the code publicly open, but the secret's hidden. Um, so a little vocab, you know, define your terms. It's the, I learned this in the eighth grade. So a review is a proposed change to code. You kind of have your trunk of code, your master, whatever, and then a review is a, a proposed, I want to take this code and put it in there. A change is the same thing. A robot is something, it's a human, or a, it, it's a robot is a cron job, or a CI job, or it's some kind of automation that's involved. Um, a review is also a verb, so if I'm looking at a, a change, and I provide review, and I press plus one, this code looks good, that's a review. Um, and then land is a verb, meaning to take the thing that is proposed and to push it onto trunk, or push it onto master. All right. So I have a definition of code review which is developing software by proposing changes, then seeking peer review and approval of those changes, um, which is basically this idea that you propose things and then they land, and then people that review them and then they land. Um, that's a little different. When I was researching this, I found out that a lot of people, a lot of the ideas on the internet is that code review is you lock all 12 developers in a room for three days and make them read all the code. And I was like, really? I don't think that's gonna work out super well. There's like Eclipse plugins that make this easier. I'm like, what? <laughs> um, so that's not what we're focusing on today. But it boils down to two basic things, right? So it boils down to the review happens before the merge, and the approver is not the author. And then this extends to where you add robots. So probably the robots are running some tests before anyone looks at the code, and then probably robots are actually deploying that code to production after the changes have been landed. Um, so why, why do people do code review? Well, the idea here is to have fewer defects, um, but there's also a lot of social effects too. So like how many people read the Phoenix Project? Everybody. Um, code review really decreases the, the power of a Brent because the Brent can only move as fast as people are willing to review his or her code. And then the other side of the skill spectrum in your organization, those people are always able to see the code that your other engineers are writing and they're like, oh, that's how this is going. And the best, the best kind of a review is minus one, I don't understand this, I guess we need to have a little training session where I learn about Python list comprehensions, or whatever it is. 
Um, the, the, the logo for DevOps Days Boston is this, is this, I believe, the Boston Tea Party, and they're throwing away silos, and they're throwing away egos, and they're throwing away blame. And I think that that happens when code review is used by operations teams. Um, silos are thrown away because when you are using code review, when you have this change that's publicly viewable on the web, anybody on any team can look and see what the progress of that ticket is because you can see that the robots are minus one it for this reason, the code isn't written yet, somebody is mad about something. Um, it throws away blame because when one person writes the code and then two other people approve the code, that's like half your team has decided this change is good enough. So <laughs> nobody's holding on to it themselves. Um, we did this as a group. Um, and then you throw away egos because if you've done a code review like, or, or uh, in a system like OpenStack where you're getting minus one 10, 15 times a week, you very quickly learn that it's not about you, it's about the code. And three weeks later you're like, I would like to have as much feedback on the code as I can possibly get. Um, it's a lot of great. So, your code review process is just reading, re <laughs> reading review resistant superbugs. Um, this is definitely a joke. It's also a little true. <laughs> do, do watch out for that. Um, so, tools and techniques, there is an entire 45 minute talk that I would love to give on the differences between these code review tools. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time for that, but GitLab is probably the thing you should check out. Um, GitHub is probably the thing you're using, and Garrett is the best. Uh, it's what we use in OpenStack. And, and a big part of, of kind of, especially the culture around DevOps, is to say that the tools actually don't matter, it's the processes, but, but, but. Um, <laughs> Garrett has certain functionality that isn't just missing in GitHub, it's done wrong in GitHub. And so what we do in OpenStack is we build workflows on top of that functionality. And to go back to GitHub, most OpenStack developers, when they go back to GitHub, they're like, this is, this is like building with Fisher-Price toys. This is ridiculous. Okay, so techniques. Techniques are much more interesting. So when I'm reviewing code, whether it's operations code or normal code, I kind of do a two-pass system. And so Jez Humble has this great quote where he says, we can't know if it will work, but we can prove known defects. And so that first pass is all about proving known defects. Hey, did you write tests? Hey, is this spelled right? Hey, is your commit message okay? That kind of stuff. Like, there's a lot of ways to get an early minus one from me before I've even really read the code. And then that second pass is about reading the code. And I think most people kind of do this. And the second pass is actually an effort spectrum. Okay, so you can have really low effort, like, hey, the person who wrote this patch is very smart, approved, I didn't even read it. And then there's all the way to the right of like, you try to rewrite it yourself to see if you can make it more elegant. And everything in between, reading the docs, testing it locally, all that kind of stuff. Um, questions you may not be asking yourself when reviewing code that you should. Like, does this conflict with other work that's going on? Um, does it allow, does it follow the patterns elsewhere in the file or elsewhere in the project? Because you might have written totally valid Go, but if it doesn't look like the rest of the Go in the project, it's gonna cause somebody a headache. And then the other question is, is it the third time we've copied and pasted this pattern? Maybe we need to get a little more abstract. Um, and finally, is the patch too big? Because what we'll find out as we go into the processes and how humans are actually doing this stuff, is that when you have a lot of code review going on, small patches land and big patches stagnate. Okay. So moving on, infrastructure as code. I have a definition of infrastructure as code. Um, describe your infrastructure with code, track it in Git, modify it using code review, and deploy it using robots. This is pretty straightforward. This is a CD pipeline for Puppet or Ansible or whatever, Terraform, whatever you're using. Um, and that brings us to tooling, where I'm not gonna teach you about tooling. There are a lot of vendors here that can teach you about technologies that will get you to infrastructure as code. Um, personally, I'm a Puppet, Ansible, Terraform person, but uh, that's maybe at least two too many, so <laughs> whatever. A lot of great people are doing it. A lot of great people are doing it not even for the second, for the first time. And the second job I went to where we were using infrastructure as code was a really good experience for me because I got to learn on the failures of my first time. Okay, so here's the question to think about. is like, how does code review change? Because developers have been doing code review for a long time. But system operators have not been doing code review for a long time. How does it change a little bit when you're reviewing code that, that directly affects production, not just software that will run in production, but the configuration of servers and switches and stuff? Think about that. And then I will run through a variety of the things that the OpenStack infrastructure project pushes through code review. And so the first thing, um, I think I have, to, I have to be over here for, Failures in my, okay. So anytime we change a daemon, so the OpenStack infrastructure team runs maybe four or five daemons that we write ourselves in Python. So anytime those are changed, you know, they deployed for master. So anytime there's just software changes, that, that goes through code review. Um, 
the configuration of those daemons goes through code review. So anytime we're running a software, whether it's a Garrett or a GitLab or an Etherpad or whatever we're running, um, all that configuration is checked into Git. And if you would like to change the Java heap or whatever, you do that by proposing a, a change to the code review system. And then people approve it or disapprove it, and then eventually it lands. And then once it lands, you know, it changes the servers. The robots change the servers. Um, and then there's traditional system administration tasks, like Puppet's great at this, changing users on a system, setting up files, packages, starting services, all that kind of stuff. Um, we do a lot of image building in OpenStack. Every time we boot a virtual machine, it's booted from, a, from an image, and those images are regenerated every night, and that those images are regenerated from source files. You know, we have kind of manifests that decide, that it's a thing called Disk Image Builder that describes how to build these images. It works kind of like Packer. Um, anytime someone wants to change our docs, that goes through code review. We don't use a wiki. We, we directly, um, we, we manage that stuff in uh, restructured text and then generate rendered docs onto a website. Um, we also use test definitions. So we have about 600 repositories and we have about a thousand different tests. And those, those tests are all written in bash. You know, generally it's like a bash entry point to some kind of testing framework um, with some setup and all that. And then uh, that's all managed, all that bash is actually embedded in YAML and that YAML is, is parsed out and, and vomited aggressively into Jenkins <laughs> using something called Jenkins Job Builder. So, we just have all this, this stuff that's managed as flat files in Git, it's managed through code review, and then when it lands you know, on a timer or whatever, the robots push that into our, our CI system, so our CI system is controlled. And this is one of the great advantages of code review, right? If I would like to change one test, but that test is used by four different repositories, and so getting all four representatives from all four of those groups to come along and say, yes, this works for me, yes, this works for me, yes, this works for me, that's where the power, like the openness of code review really comes into play. Um, if you want to create a Git repository, we have 600 and growing Git repositories, so if you would like to create a new Git repository for your project, you go to a special YAML file and you make a change and you add your thing and you submit that for approval and then people approve it and then you get your Git repository. The same thing is true for the ACLs, when you would like to add new people to, your, to the list of people allowed to contribute to your project or remove somebody or change this group, you know, that's all done. Um, with stuff that is checked into Git and goes through code review. Um, we, we have a lot of IRC channels. We have something like 150 IRC channels in OpenStack. And if you would like a new one, you, yes, you guessed it, you go to a YAML file and you write the name and, and all this stuff, uh, basically the configuration. And then, um, so when there are events come through our code system, like a change has been proposed to this repository, that's relevant to developers in per, sometimes many channels. And so the mapping between which channels care about which events is also kept in Git and goes through code review and YAML. Um, similarly, specification for future work. So if somebody wants to extend something in, in the OpenStack infrastructure project, you know, like a, bl a blueprint, for instance, that gets written in long form, submitted as a code review, it gets bike shadowed a little bit, eventually we like it, we approve it, we land it, and then the work starts to actually implement whatever was, was talked about. Um, and then we, we do some like, we go even further to the point of stuff that may, maybe didn't need to be done, but, but did. Um, so if somebody runs for an elected position in OpenStack, they do that by submitting a code review to add their candidacy to a YAML file, um, complete with position statement. Uh, the, 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 we have 600 repos and like 1,000 jobs, and there, it's a many-to-many -many mapping. So figuring out all the templating and stuff, there's like a 7,000 line file that holds that mapping, and that's the kind of thing that takes an entire village to understand, um, and it's good. Uh, if you would like to cut a release of any OpenStack software, you do that with a YAML file. Uh, if you'd like to add a new dependency, like a new Python library that is being depended on by OpenStack, you do that with, a, with code review, and the reason that is very highly scrutinized is because OpenStack has a requirement, you know, that all the code in, a, in OpenStack is Apache 2 or Apache 2 compatible, so we wanna make sure that the licensing of the dependency and any transitive dependencies of that dependency is compatible with this promise we've made. Um, we're sysadmins, we have Grafana. Grafana has dashboards, and our Grafana dashboards are in YAML, so we have this thing called Graph YAML that basically takes YAML and creates Grafana dashboards, and those, the, the source, you know, the, the, the the YAML that defines those dashboards is checked into Git, and you modify it with code review. Um, if you would like to have a meeting in one of our four IRC meeting channels, you need a spot on the calendar, and the way you get a spot on the calendar is by a YAML file, <laughs> which goes through code review. So, um, 
there's things that are very traditional system administration here, and then there's things that are basically just data management, and we do it all through code review. Like, everyone has an, the ability to vote on any of these things, um, which has really great features. It allows anyone to touch any part of the product. They can dig and they can explore, and, it, and there's, no, there's no waiting and there's no blocking. Certainly, there is some time wasted on people just rubber stamping things that is obviously like, sure, you can have that meeting. I don't care. Um, and so there's a balance we're trying to strike uh, between w what is good use of people's time and what is not good use of time. But the ability to kind of open up the entire process so anyone can see and take it apart and, and extend it is, is something we get a lot of advantage out of. So the game. So once you get to a point where you have a lot of code review and things are changed through code review, the world changes a little bit and certain emergent behaviors emerge. And so the most obvious is that small patches, small patches sit, or small patches land and big patches sit. Um, sometimes people will um, beg you for reviews, like please review, please review, please review this. Um, sometimes four people will go in a conference room and make a plan on how to do something and one of them will write the patch and the other three will just be like approved, 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 and then it's in. And that's not really what code review is about, they kind of like, they didn't really read the code because they already made the plan and they knew what the code said. Um, sometimes people will learn who the soft touches in your organization are and like, oh, this person always approves my code, so I will, I will go to that person a lot. That person will get my stuff done easily. Um, sometimes one or two contributors will do a lot of reviews all week and they spend a lot of time and they, they work hard to make that happen. And that's great work, but it means that their total lines of code that they wrote goes down. So your organization needs to be ready to, rec to like value that they do that review time, sometimes more than the amount of, of writing code they're doing. Um, and then the question is like, how does code review change when operations are done? And I think the number one is merge speed is an issue. Like a code review system like OpenStack, sometimes patches will wait for six months before they land. And in an operations context, sometimes shit's on fire, yo, and we need to land it. Um, and so the way we get around that, like the way we do it is we will break our own rules for operational stability. Sometimes we don't wait for other people to be around to approve, we self-approve. Sometimes we approve without the tests being consulted. Sometimes um, we go around the system entirely and use the root shell, um, but that's a last resort. Uh, then uh, the other thing is, you know, what we, the, the second, I mean, there's a lot of stuff here, but like the big one I think is that access control in your organization once you have code review for infrastructure as code, moves from like a Unix-based like SSH keys and sudo into that access control is now implemented in your code review system. Like whatever Git server thing you're doing. And this is another place where if I had more time, I'd talk about the differences between Garrett and GitHub, and especially on that one, you really kind of want a real tool. Um, all right, so problems that emerge out of this. I will call it the first person YOLO and the second person YOLO problem. So in OpenStack we have one person writes it and then two people have Two people both plus two it and the second person approves it and then it lands. All right, so there's the first person YOLO is, that first person kind of has no real responsibility. They're like, whatever, this isn't landing because I plus two'd it. And so they're just like stamp, stamp, stamp. And that's, that's kind of annoying. And then that second person is like, well, I don't know if the other person even read the code. Like, uh. <laughs> and then they, they get really shy about stamping because they don't want to break everything. Um, there's also the other side of that, where the second person that comes through is like, well, I don't really have to read this because the author's smart and the first reviewer's smart, so this is probably good stamp, 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 and then your infrastructure is broken. So you need to watch out for both of those. Um, chickens and pigs is a concept from Agile. It's actually a retired concept from Agile in the latest version of like whatever Agile methodology, I don't know, the people that are in charge of that thing, they actually removed chickens and pigs from the thing. And one of the reasons they cited was that it doesn't leave room for a knowledgeable expert to participate. And code review is a great way to bring in a knowledgeable expert. Like, we have somebody who's in OpenStack who's really good at Java tuning. He has nothing to do with the infrastructure maintenance day to day. But when we're like, hey, our Java thing is not Java-ing, right? This person shows up and is like, yeah, you just, you change these magic numbers. We're like, approved. <laughs> and then, our, and then but, but you need to watch out because that, that is like the definition of the chicken and pig problem. Like that person does not uh, have the wider view. And we actually, with this exact scenario, opened ourselves up to a security vulnerability because we just kind of approved it and didn't take a look at the wider situation of what was going on. Now definitely the, the benefits have outweighed the faults there, but just be aware. Um, work in progress changes are great for communicating with your team. You can propose a change to infrastructure as code 
um, to a code review system that isn't ready yet and get early feedback, go on vacation, whatever. There's also some of the ways that humans interact with other humans. So silence means no. Right? Like the, the but in the perfect world, I would propose patch and if my coworker didn't like my patch, my coworker would put a minus one on my patch and say this sucks for reasons. But we don't live in a perfect world and so sometimes what you'll get is you'll get, I haven't looked at that patch yet, four months later. It's just a, 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 desire, a, a conscious decision not to check into it. And it's the same as leaving an email unanswered or leaving a ticket unanswered. Um, maybe it's a little more obvious because it's so public, but it still has the problem of, of when you don't know how to say no, sometimes people won't say no, they will just leave you with silence. Um, there's also this thing, kind of the hostage problem that allows you to force the issue. If you do have a situation where some people don't like a strategy because, well, there's a problem and part of your team wants to have an aggressive, quick and dirty solution, and part of your team wants to think about it for a little while, and the pressure's on, um, what, what, what can happen is the, the quick and dirty team can get together, they can propose the quick and dirty solution to your code review system, and then be ready to like approve it, or they can just approve it themselves, without getting total consensus or buy-in from managers and stuff like that. And so, that puts them in a situation where the, the team that wants to go slow or doesn't want to engage with the problem is then they're the hostages. They're, they're forced to engage with that, either put their foot down and explain why they don't want it or get off their butts and write their elegant solution or, or just accept that the infrastructure is gonna be suboptimal for a little while. Um, I don't really have a solution. I'm just pointing out that these are the patterns that come out of what you're doing. Okay, so what's next for code review for OpenStack Info? The first is something called you know, kind of full server lifecycle management. So basically, if you're using Terraform, you're probably already doing this, but it's the idea that virtual machines that we run services on should be, their entire lifecycle should be managed through Git. So right now, what we do is we like make a node definition and puppet, and then somebody goes and launches the server, and they line up in hostname, but we'd like to get it more, probably where there's a YAML file with all the servers we have, and then Ansible comes along and, and launches the servers, or whatever. The other thing is called the, the thing longer, which is this, this very demo, very demoware, very uh, like super beta thing, but basically when you look at Puppet or something, the way that the ideas behind Puppet and Ansible and in traditional configuration, it's like a router making a change on a server is a bug. It's like pretty straightforward, but there's, and I've worked in this environment for like five years, there's lots of times the, the router makes a change on a server and it's because it's not a configuration change and it's not a light cycle management change, it's not, something we want on the next server that gets rebuilt. It's, the classic example is you had a bad deploy and the daemon started squirting logs into a place it wasn't supposed to. And then you made an, a better deploy and the, and the daemon stopped doing that. But those log files are still in that random location that was bad. And somebody needs to go clean those out, right? And, and there isn't really a good place in an Ansible or a Terraform or a Puppet or whatever you're doing to like do those kinds of ad hoc tasks with like a DevOps flavor to them. It's just someone rooting up and doing it. So we're like, well, what we'll do with the thing longer is we'll just create a task list in YAML, of course, of like shell commands, and we'll put that on the bastion and we'll check it into Git. And when someone wants to remove a file, they'll just type, they'll make a little task in the thing longer syntax that is remove that file, please, and propose it to the code review system and people will bike shed the, the shell. And then once it's approved, the robots will pick up this command and run it. So like, I wanna, I wanna look a little bit about what, what that looks like. So, so if, we, if we come over here. Um, so I have two directories here. I have thing longer tasks and thing longer tasks live. And these are the same Git repo, just different checkouts. And the thing longer tasks is kind of the one that's on the Git server, it's the authoritative one. And the thing longer tasks live is kind of the one that, that, that runs on this bastion host that's gonna do the work. Right, and so if you, sing longer tasks live, and you just kind of have a cron job that's running git pull over here pretty frequently, and it's just, it's up to date, it's fine. You just, every five minutes, we're up to date. And you see the end of thing longer tasks, and you open up tasks.yaml, and you can see that I've got a bunch of derp going on here. Whoa, that wasn't what we wanted. Whoa, okay, so that's like actually not gonna work. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, now we're mirrored and I actually have like a chance. Sort of. Um, Mm -hmm. 
So if we open up tasks.yaml, and we split, and we do it yaml. All right, and we look at git diff. We can see that all we've added here, in addition to a new line that we don't need, uh, oh, that's a, that's a minus. Anyways, um, we've just added this blob of, sorry, I'll push it up. This blob of like little minimalistic YAML that is like run this job with its name and here's some shell I'd like you to run. And we get commit dash a dash dash m job ops, woo. And then we pretend we're on the server and this, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the cron job that runs git pull runs and this time it notices some changes. And so it runs the thing longer and it runs this arbitrary shell, which is kind of cool. Um, and so you take that a little bit further and uh, you lose the one that had the thing you needed. There we go. Come on, there we go. And then you get a, like a review like this. So remember we had a bad log file. So this is a review just like, hey, I'd like to add this task. The SSH is over to root server one and RM's the, the bad log file. Um, so this is like very, very beta, but I think we're gonna probably try to do something like this. Um, and then once, once you're here, you know, once you've got to the point where it's code review, all the other devops -y things start to kick in. Like other people can collaborate, other people can see what you're doing. You can learn from other people's um, behaviors, you can just scroll up in the task file to see how we solved that problem last year, and that kind of stuff. And so that's actually all I have. So thank you very much for having me. Um, it's been great coming to Boston. Does anybody have any questions? All right, oh, wait, we have, yeah, yeah? Oh, is there anything in the OpenStack infrastructure that isn't in code review? Yeah, there's lots of stuff, and this is why we're talking about the thing longer. Like when we need to migrate like a database from one virtual machine to another virtual machine, that's like a manual task. Um, when we need to manage secrets, that doesn't go through code review, that's actually kind of checked in manually. Um, when we're managing our servers, like when we need to boot new virtual machines that are long lived, not just like ephemeral managed by the cloud, um, that's manual. So there's, there's a fair amount of stuff. Like when we, we use Andrew file system for funny reasons. And so when we need to bring on a new Andrew file system node, that's like half of that's in an Ansible playbook and the other half is manual. But still it's not triggered by something code review driven, which is kind of the annoyance. Did you have a question? Oh, okay, yeah? Attention? Okay, so how do you manage people's attention? Um, yeah, so basically everyone on the project is always feels completely under this avalanche of incoming reviews with a side of note of people being like, actually poking them like, hey, can you review my thing? And you're like, your thing is in the list of things I'm trying to get to. Um, and so people try to do more reviews. They try to do more reviews and they, they try to focus their time. Sometimes what we'll do with our organization is we have, not sometimes, what we, we actually listed a, in YAML, of course, a, a list of, of priority tasks, like big initiatives that we wanna work on, and then we assigned a specific tag to those tasks, and then people whose reviews are connected to those tasks tag their review with the tag. And so you're filtering what you can do, and what I do is I filter based on that tag so that I hit the stuff that is in the priority queue first, um, which unfortunately leaves a lot of the, sometimes the most important contributions are not tasked to a specific tag, um, sort of leaves them in the, in the dust. I suggest gamify it. So it was a suggest that we gamify it. Um, yeah. And, and so OpenStack does track uh, with a, uh, there's a website called Stackalytics from Marantis that tracks every review you make. And so you can see how many plus ones you made, how many plus twos you made, how many minus ones. And one of the things that comes out of that is if somebody has like a 99% plus one radio, ratio approved, you know, the, the, they're voting positively 99% of the time. The, the worry there is that they're not voting minus one enough. And if they're not bonus voting minus one enough, it's because they're not reading the code closely enough and finding bugs. And then the second order effect of that is people start minus oneing for any dumb little thing because they want to gamify that percentage number to go down, and that just frustrates contributors because they're like, this doesn't matter. All right, I'm done with time. Thank you very much. I'll be in the corner at lunch. You've been wonderful, Boston. Yes.